fantastic. He's been doing this for years over on the west side. Jeff is a certified John Maxwell facilitator. If you don't know John Maxwell, he is probably the number one guy in the leadership space on the planet. Jeff is the vice president and sales manager over at Independent Bank. And for those of you who do not know, Jeff is father to two of the greatest sons on the planet. I have proof of this because I just heard it like 47 seconds ago. So Jeff's going to talk about a topic he knows well and a topic that I think we all need to learn better. Without further ado, Mr. Jeff Clark. Thank you, sir. The problem with that introduction is you got to hold up to it, right? <laughs> so, my son is finishing his last year at Western this coming up year, okay? Uh, and then my other son has got one more day left at high school and he graduates, which is awesome. So, it's a proud moment uh, as a dad to be at this point to see them become at this level of being young men. So, it was interesting. So, my son was home for part of the weekend, part of the weekend he was in New York, but anyways, we were discussing his leadership class he's having this summer, okay? And he says, our textbook is John Maxwell. And I said, that's awesome. <laughs> so we had a chance yesterday to, to kind of converse about it for quite a while, it was really good. So my son says to me, he says, I think I'm a charismatic leader. I said, yes, you are a charismatic leader, there's no doubt about it. True story. So when my son, before my son was born, the screen, the, what do you call the baby picture? Ultrasound, right? He's waving in the ultrasound, <laughs> true story. He's never stopped that wave, it's awesome. So he's a mini me in a lot of ways, which is great. So we're gonna talk about leadership today because really everything rises and falls on leadership. And it's great to see that in your children. So I'm gonna help give you some ideas on your personal, and professional lives, if we can share ways to connect more and communicate more. That's what leadership's all about. Actually, you know what? If you really want, I got notes if you want to take notes. Okay. Yeah. So anybody go to, a, go to a seminar and they learn a bunch of stuff and they don't do anything with it? Right? I do. Okay, I have a jacket, that means I'm a professional, right? I know what I'm talking about, I can take it off now, is that fair? Okay. Good. So, Take one to three ideas, okay? Take one to three ideas out of today and implement them in your life. If you can learn to communicate more, connect more, you can improve how you run your business, how you run your sales, become a better parent, whatever it might take. If you can inspire people to dream more, to do more, to learn more, and become more, you are a leader. Leadership is all about inspiring other people all about uplifting other people and helping them become better, okay? So, I'm gonna talk about two components of leadership today. The first is the attitude of a leader. The importance of having the right attitude as a leader. And the second, I'm gonna talk about something that I think is critically important in our environment these days, and it's servant leadership. It's how to become a servant leader and how important it is to make a difference in other people's lives. So I had an opportunity a few years ago to go to Haiti on a mission trip. And the mission trip was with our church. It was a faith-based organization and it was a faith-based trip. Trip. We went with a group called Mission of Hope. And we went there with the uh, youth group, which is like 15 to 18 year old, you know, young adults basically. So what we do is we go and we talk to people in their homes, which is great. It's an opportunity to help people. And we had some doctors with us that helped us in the medical side of things. And then we were there to do kind of a message of faith or a message of important things, just basics of life. Healthcare, how to pre prepare their food, basic things, it was so important. And it was interesting because you really get to see these amazing people in a completely different world. Who's been to like a third world country like, that, like Haiti or something like that? What's takeaways? Any, what's, your, what's your reaction to that? My reaction is thank God I live in the United States. I have the opportunity to be here blessed. Mm -hmm. Grateful. Grateful, absolutely. So, but it was interesting, the people were amazing. So we were there the last day, 
And this lady comes up to us and she says, can you go talk to my mom? We said, we said yeah, absolutely. Now at this point we've got a couple of adults, a couple of the you know, youth, and then we've got, as, as you go throughout the week, some of the kids in the village join you. And all of a sudden you've got a tribe. There's like 12 or 13 of them, right? So we said, yeah, we'll go talk to your mom. So we, go, we, we trudged through the, the fields, and the farm fields, and man, different technology. They don't have the equipment we have here, that's for sure. So we get into this little, little farmhouse, right? We walk up to the corn, and this about five foot tall little lady comes out of the corn. She's about 75 years old. 75 years old in Haiti is pretty old. Beautiful yellow dress. She comes up to me, she gives me a hug. And she was so grateful that we were there. And it was like, it was that kind of hug like you hadn't seen your grandma for the last couple years. It was crazy. So we sit on the porch with her and we talk. Now in Haiti there's a complete language barrier. But we found a way to connect. And if you listen, you can always find a way to connect. So we asked her some questions and we kind of got a sense that she had a big family. And I says, he said, or he said, how many grandkids do you have? So I have 60. 60 grandkids. Can you believe Imagine that. I got two, two, two boys, that's enough. So we asked her some advice, some life advice. Tell us something, you know, tell us. What do you want out of life? What do you want for your family? What do you want for your 60 grandkids? She says, I just want them to be as blessed as I am. Right there, standing on the porch, as blessed as she is. She lives in a 300 square foot cement house with a tin roof, with no electricity, no water, no air. And she was blessed. Now the Mission of Hope is an organization down there, and their mission statement is to transform the lives of every man, woman, and child in Haiti which is an awesome mission statement. And when you get there, trying to help people, right, you think you'll help make a difference in their lives. Well, that moment for me transformed my way of looking at life. And my appreciation and gratitude for things changed. Gratitude is one of the most valuable lessons you can have as a leader. And, and I tell people who said from the audience, you know, being grateful for what we have. We don't realize what we have in this country. The abundance in this country is unbelievable. As a leader, appreciate where you're at and value what you have, your people, your team, your friends, your family, a building, air conditioning, for crying out loud. Appreciate these things. Appreciate the people around you. Things you appreciate will appreciate the relationships you put value on will grow. The relationships you put value on will grow. So I was in a uh, diner a couple weeks ago and sitting in a Saturday morning. It was a small little diner. And the tables were all close to each other. Close enough where you would have conversation with people appropriately, right? And there was a dad and a son. And the son was about five years old. Dad's probably 40. Um, and we're talking a little bit, and I said to the son, I said to the little guy, I says, hey, that's great, you get to have uh, breakfast with your dad this morning. He goes, yeah, that's awesome. And he's all excited, he's throwing down his pancakes, this is great, you know, mom and the sisters are at home somewhere, and it's just me and, me and my dad. And he's smiling, and with that, then I see the dad smile, which is great. And I said, and I said to the dad, I said, I said, this is so important. It's so important to have this time right now when they're young. I said, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. They're 18 and 21 now. But if you have this pancake breakfast at 5, you can have the phone call at 21 that says, Hey, Dad, let's go to the bar. So things you appreciate, people you appreciate, will appreciate. Okay? So that's kind of the gratitude piece of having the right attitude towards things. I'm going to ask you a question. So this is on the animal kingdom. Maybe some people have seen this, maybe some people haven't. Who is the biggest animal in the jungle? Elephant. 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 Who's the tallest animal in the jungle? Giraffe. Who's the fastest animal in the jungle? Cheetah. 
Who's the smartest animal in the jungle? Human. I, was, I knew someone was going to say that for some reason. <laughs> who, who, if, if the human was not there, who would be the next smartest animal in the jungle? Oops. Chimpanzee. And that's going to depend on the person too, right? I mean, chimpanzee might be smarter than some people, right? <laughs> Okay, let me ask you a question. Everybody knows the answer. Who's the king of the jungle? Lion. lion. Why is the lion the king of the jungle? Because, what's that? PR. What's that? PR. Yeah, PR. <laughs> he's got a good PR company. He's got good social media. So he's not the smartest, not the strongest, he's not the biggest, he's not the tallest, he's not the fastest. He's the king of the jungle because he believes he's the king of the jungle. The elephant sees himself as lunch. It's all in your mindset, right? All in your mindset. If you can believe in yourself, you'll go further. If you can believe in, believe in other people, you'll go further. You'll help them go further. So have high expectations for yourself, for your company, for others. Okay? Have high expectations. See people as a tenant. They'll rise to the occasion. They will. Every time. Won't they never? So, Deb and I have known each other for a little while. We've known each other for, since 1996 or 97. Is that true? Yeah. And we worked at an organization called Ameritech before it got bought by AT&T. And Deb's going to help me tell part of the story today, as a matter of fact. So Deb, will you share with your group how we met and what happened, please? I'm Deb Davis, and just recently retired uh, last June because of Jeff Clatterball, 23 years at AT&T. I was in restaurant management for 12 years, and I walked away from my job, just got tired of, tired of managing, and I just wanted a new start. So I actually, when I walked off my job, I didn't have a car and was on um, unemployment. So at the time, I got dropped off at an interview at AT&T, well, it was Ameritech at the time in Dearborn. And they were renovating, they were in the trailer, and I met Jeff. Jeff um, interviewed me right on the spot. That was back when we filled out applications. He <laughs> interviewed me right on the spot, and the only thing he asked me was, what type of experience do you have to work for this technology company? At that time, I had worked prior for GM when OnStar first came out. I was on that project. And the only experience I had was I was the one on the phone that talked to the technician at the dealership on how to program the cell phone for the client's car. And he said, I said, that's the only experience I have. And he hired me based off of that experience. And that's how I met Jeff. Jeff put me, um, he entrusted, he believed that I was able to be the leader that I became before I left at and And it's all about having that belief in people. It's so important. And to see the value and where they can go and what they can accomplish. And that's awesome. And you left as a leader in an organization, fantastic. So attitude, right? Starts with attitude. You gotta have the belief to do things. You gotta take action, right? You gotta take action. The third part of having a leader's attitude is taking action. So Mr. Uh, Kevin Bozeman here and myself have created a little system. It's called Do It Now, okay? Every day when I wake up in the morning, I say to myself, do it now, do it now, do it now. And I'll say it about 50 times. And then at the end of the day, if I still have the energy, I'll say it again. And Kevin and I are accountability partners, okay? So we will check with each other to make sure we're taking action, doing the right activities, and doing things now. Now the funny thing is, after doing this for a while, I'll do this exercise for a while, I'll be going throughout my day and I'll be deciding, what should I do? Should I take this path or this path? And the little voice in my head says, do it now. Do it now. So we're going to do a group exercise. I'm going to say do it now one time. And the group is going to say do it now three times. Just so you <coughs> remember the sentence. Okay? Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Now a little louder. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. So Gary Keller has a book called The One Thing. And the one thing is saying, are you doing the right activities to make the biggest impact in your personal life, 
in your business life. And the one thing is, what's the one thing you can do, if done right, will help make all other things easy, or, or unnecessary? And think about that. If you're going through your day, are you doing good activities or the best activity? And the best activity is that that can make the biggest impact on whatever it is. It might be the pancake breakfast with your son. It might be, in my case, prospecting with business partners to help gen develop a relationship to ensure that my business is sustained. Are you doing the thing that makes the biggest impact to you? Okay. A leader is in, in, in the, the mindset of whatever it takes to get things done. Now, obviously, there's an integrity check on that. You don't do things that are out of line with that. Okay? What's my time frame, Terry? <laughs> Five, Five to seven minutes. minutes. Five to seven minutes left? Yep. Perfect. So, servant leadership is such an important aspect of leading people. And having the right attitude helps you become a better leader, helps you become a better servant leader. So Terry started with uh, the introductions today and having everybody else besides the club MCC members go first, which I thought was great. John Maxwell's got a quote, and I love it. It says, <clears throat> it says, follow me, I'm right behind you. Follow me, I'm right behind you. And I think that's a perfectly appropriate for this group. So if you look at servant leadership, you look at people who are uh, exemplified leadership in our world, you look at a Martin Luther King Jr., a Mother Teresa, people who lead by giving and not receiving. And that's what servant leadership is all about. So what's that count today? 45, 50? 45? 45. 45. About. Uh, it's been running that way for six months, thereabouts. Now, that takes servant leadership to bring people together, right? So, Terry Bean, you've been running this for 13 years. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that might have been a good thing or bad thing, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, it's been awesome, man. I get to hang out with you, love. Absolutely. Fun. So Terry and I were talking, we were talking a month or two ago, and he's told me that his goal every single day, every single day was to help three people connect to somebody else. <laughs> That's a pretty lofty goal in my opinion. And if you look at this room, everybody has been impacted positively somehow from you. And you are a great example of what servant leadership can do and how to help other people get what they want in life, not what you want in life. So, thank you, sir. <laughs> servant leadership has many facets to it, but a couple that I want to talk about in closing is asking questions and listening and inspiring words. Okay, so we've got two ears and one mouth. We should use them proportionally. So how many times have you been to an event, a sales event, any type of training, and you, you hear, I need to ask more questions, or the right <coughs> questions? Who's, who's heard these, that type of thing before, right? What do we do as salespeople when we go back to our office? We listen to that, we ask a lot of good questions, or no? We talk, right? Asking the right questions, understanding what's important to people. Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. Who's read that? Who's read, who's read that book? Quite a few? Okay. So it talks about why you do what you do. Why an organization does what it does. I think it's very important to understand your team, the people around you, your business partners. Why do they do what they do? What's important to them? What's their motivating factor? Because as a leader, you can inspire people to learn more, dream more, do more and become more, you're only gonna do that if you understand what's important to them and what motivates them and what their why is. So Joe Wallen is my business partner. And Joe and I work together every single day. Joe's 
motivating factor is being a fantastic father. Period. Okay? Now, we can have a transaction, we can have a situation. Uh, in the mortgage world, he can do a great job. And I say, Joe, great job. Thank you so much for taking care of that client. They really appreciate that. They gave me a call. They said, excellent. Okay? And that's great. Perfect, right? But I can say to Joe, Joe, you've done such a wonderful job as a father. I love to see Cora now as a young lady taking the next step in her life. You did a fantastic job as a dad. You're the rock. You made all the difference. What's going to motivate Joe a lot more? Absolutely, right? Something that matters to him, right? <clears throat> and then listen. So Nelson Mandela's, one of his leadership principles as a leader is a leader always speaks last. Leader always speaks last. It's so important as a leader to understand other people first before being understood. And his belief was to allow people to be appreciative and allow them to share their ideas and philosophies and, and thoughts with him before interjecting any of his opinion. Leader speaks last. <clears throat> so, you've been watching me up here for 20 minutes, and I'm guessing that most of you at this point have said, I bet you he is a runner, right? <laughs> well, you guys have it. True story. I ran a half marathon. This was only a couple years ago. I'll repeat it. True story. <laughs> so my brother-in-law and I uh, made a commitment to run the Detroit Half Marathon. And if you don't know, a half marathon is 13.1 miles. I didn't know that before the day. <laughs> Anyways, it's in October in Detroit, okay? So it's 6.30 in the morning in October in Detroit. It was 38 degrees. 38 degrees, right? This is a great idea. So now we're geared up. We got our regular running gear on, sweatpants, you know, jacket, hat, gloves, all bundled up. I'm thinking this is a great idea. So I trained for a 13.1 mile marathon by running three to four miles. Does that make sense, right? It's <laughs> a good idea. So the first three or four miles weren't that bad. Imagine that, I wonder why. So we get down to that point and I start feeling sore and feeling a little, uh, feeling some pain in the body a little bit. This is what happens though. Who, who's actually run a real marathon that's really done a great job at it besides my slow time? No one else? Okay. There are thousands of people along the path. Thousands of people with signs, handing out water, giving inspiring words, encouragement, you can do it, keep going. Only 10 more miles, then we're helping. And they're, they're there to support you. It's, it's unbelievable. So we get about halfway through the race, and I'm starting to feel pain in places I didn't know I could feel pain in. Okay? And it was brutal. But we kept going, and we crossed over the finish line. We actually crossed. We actually made it. So on one, two, three steps past the finish line, and my right knee is completely shot. I'm on the ground, not sure how I'm going to get a mile and a half back to my car at this point. How did I run 13.1 miles? and three steps, and then give up. Mind over matter. Mind over matter. Words are powerful. Words are powerful. I would not have crossed that finish line if it were not for all of the volunteers giving me the inspired words. Think about this. It, your parents said something to you as a kid that still resonates with you today, good or bad. True statement. Good or bad, it still affects you. The things you say to your children will impact them for the rest of their lives. The words you use with your business partners, with your team, with your employees, will make all the difference in the world. 
Inspiring words are so powerful. If you inspire people to do more, to learn more, to dream more, and become more, you are a leader. I appreciate it.